The accident of November 716 Romeo Lima was primarily caused by the instructor pilot's decision to take off with too much weight in the airplane. But the accident chain included improper runway selection, followed by an attempt to climb out at low airspeed, and eventually ended with a crash into the trees. The pilot and two passengers, who were paying for an introductory flight, were all killed, although the pilot and one passenger survived the impact and died three weeks later from severe burns. The NTSB estimated the aircraft to be 73 pounds over its max gross weight of 2150 when it started its takeoff roll. We don't know if the pilot did a weight and balance, but his experience as an instructor suggests that he knew the aircraft would be at least a little on the heavy side. He probably dismissed it as no big deal. Obviously, the first lesson that we can take from this accident is not to get complacent about aircraft limitations. Complacency was a big part of at least the first two links in this accident chain. The second link was the pilot's decision to use runway 14. Winds that day were from 030 at 12 knots gusting to 20, meaning 14 had a light tailwind and the most favorable runway would have been runway 9. 9 also would have given the pilot a full thousand feet more pavement to work with and had no obstacles immediately off its departure end. We don't know for sure, but we can guess that the pilot chose runway 14 because it was closest to the ramp. It's likely that he'd done it many times before with no issues. As a pilot, I'm guilty of having chosen to do tailwind takeoffs to avoid long taxi times, but a tailwind takeoff when fully loaded is not something I've done or intend to do. This bad decision connected the first two links in the accident chain and set our pilot up for the third link, which was his airspeed problem. Departing with a tailwind not only extends your takeoff roll and shallows your climb out, but it also creates the visual illusion that the aircraft is going faster than it really is because the ground speed is higher than the airspeed. I don't have any video of myself departing with a tailwind, but I do have several of me departing with unusually strong headwinds over the last few years. In all of them where the airspeed indicator is visible, I can see that I unintentionally climb out about 10 knots above my target airspeed. This is because the ground speed is lower than what I'm used to, so my brain assumes my airspeed is probably low too. I instinctively push forward on the yoke to fix the sight picture and end up a little too fast. The pilot in this case would have been getting the opposite cues. He probably perceived that his aircraft was going plenty fast when he decided to force it into the air. Notice the unusually high pitch attitude just after rotation. He would be getting conflicting information from his senses at this point in the flight. His eyes are seeing the ground move past quickly and telling him that the plane is ready to fly, but the instruments and the mushy feeling in the controls tell him the plane is about to stall. If he had just kept the plane on the runway longer, or leveled off in ground effect like we do for a soft field takeoff until building up enough airspeed, he might have had a chance of getting the airplane established in a normal VX climb. But his decision to leave ground effect before attaining sufficient airspeed made the already dangerous situation a lot worse. The pilot has taken the aircraft into a flight regime called the Region of Reverse Command. In this area, flying slower actually causes the total drag on the airframe to increase rather than decrease. This is because, at low airspeeds, a high angle of attack is needed to generate lift, and the airplane isn't designed to fly efficiently at high angles of attack. At very low airspeeds, the thrust of the engine is barely powerful enough to sustain level flight, let alone climb. The only way to recover from this condition is to pitch forward, possibly sacrificing some altitude for airspeed so the plane can fly more efficiently. But with a 70-foot tree line fast approaching, the pilot didn't have enough altitude to let the plane descend. A witness reported that the aircraft remained nose high until he lost sight of it in the trees. His only chance of succeeding at this takeoff would have been to tightly hold best angle of climb speed until reaching a safe altitude, because this minimizes the total drag experienced by the airplane. A tip my primary instructor taught me for managing angle of attack during max performance takeoffs is that if an obstacle on the horizon line is starting to worry you, point the nose right at it as if you were trying to hit it. The airplane will make sure that you don't. Obviously that trick is no substitute for flying the correct speeds, but it's a good way to keep yourself from pulling back when your life depends on getting the max possible performance out of the aircraft. The importance of proper short field technique is another lesson pilots can take from this accident. It's hard to know for sure if this Cherokee had the muscle to carry the load they'd put in it that day or not, but we can say for sure that the pilot did not get as much out of the aircraft as it had to offer. And finally, the last lesson we can learn from this is to know when it's time to abort. The aircraft used 1,700 of the 4,100 foot paved area just to get airborne, and when it did, it clearly wasn't ready. If the pilot had closed the throttle immediately after the botched rotation, he probably could have brought the aircraft to a stop safely and had time to reconsider his options.